Pentecost. Hey, is my mic up? I can't hear myself. <laughs> Sorry. As we consider um, the Holy Spirit coming, and, and for the first time to indwell believers, I found a, a paragraph that I wanted to share. It says, Pentecost was an event marking a turning point in God's course of action. And it made a big change in the history of the church. In fact, we might even say that it was the beginning of the church. The day of Pentecost was that moment in redemptive history when God unlocked the power of the Holy Spirit and he gave it to his church, not, not just for those who were gathered there, but to the, the church of every age, to us today and every Christian throughout all time. The wind, the fire, is as much for us today as it was for those gathered in the upper room 2,000 years ago. We are to be a people of the Holy Spirit, filled and guided, as well as the people known from the Son, of the Son and of the Father. Will you stand with us as we begin our service this morning with a, a new song, actually. I, I'm sure you've heard it because it's been around for a lot of years, but it's new for us. Because it speaks of part of the job of the Holy Spirit to come and build the kingdom of God here, today, and forevermore. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like fire in our very soul. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. Thank you. 
Psalm 95 says this, Come, O people, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before God, our Maker, for He is our God. And we are His, the people of His pasture. We are the sheep of His hand. God, come cleanse us as we come humbly before you. Holy Spirit, guide our worship this morning. in all of our worship, that you would clean us and make us worthy of worshiping you. Lord, that you would work in us as your people. And so God, guide our worship for the rest of this time today. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated.
Good morning. Good morning. This one? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I want to welcome all you people, uh, especially visitors. Welcome you people that are looking, looking this morning from your home. Appreciate you tuning in for us or with us. Uh, I've got a few announcements here to go over. I was supposed to read scripture, but Tim thought this was a lesser of the two. It better put me on this one. A lot of hard names there. I might, I might, uh, they might not resemble what you think they are. So, uh, first of all, VBS is coming up, and uh, Beth mentioned she could use a nursery person or two, and a couple more crew leaders. So, if, if that would work out for you, why talk to Beth? Marty Schaefer mentioned that he wanted to thank all the people at work yesterday. I don't know if you've seen any changes, but tremendous amount of cleaning went on. Uh, all new light bulbs. Pretty nifty. And uh, so he wanted to thank everybody that showed up and, and uh, worked yesterday. So thank you. Uh, those of you that are aware, Aaron Epley is home. He's, uh, I, I think he's doing okay. And uh, not giving you detailed details, but uh, continue to pray for him. He's not out of the woods. Okay? And I thought I had one more. No, oh, that's it. Karen Brethauer, would you want to come up here, please? We ended our Awana year at the end of April, but all of the awards that we wanted to give out were not here. And the kids that earned these um, have worked really hard. They've memorized a lot of verses. They've done a lot of Bible studies. And so we wanted to really recognize them in a special way. And I know they're not all here today, but we will call their names. And if you are here, we'd like you to come up. Those that finished their first book, um, it, and this is the third grade actually on up so we got some that, that uh, I'll tell you about in a minute Shaley Coleman uh, Mahaya Jones Kayla Ogle I don't know if Kayla's here Natalie Otten I know Natalie's here come on up Natalie Maggie Peterson is Maggie here um, Skylar Castle Janae Martin Alyssa Nichols and Keelan Shea, right over here. Bev's got them for you. And they get a, a nice ribbon um, and an award, and that means they've completed their first book. We had two that had completed their second book, and that includes uh, Janelle Doherty and Trinity Erickson. I don't know if either of them are here today. Um, we had uh, two people uh, that finished their third book, Kristen Ogle and Jackson was just here. Jackson, Jackson Otten finished their third book. We've got three, we've got four of the Timothy Awards here, but I'm going to do just three of them first of all. Um, one was, uh, uh, Kristen Ogle was the other one that, that got a challenge award, and I don't think Kristen is here. Kristen also finished her fourth book, which was the Timothy Award. Uh, and then uh, Daniel Flint and Shailen Safranic. Are they both here? There's Shailen. Daniel's not here. Okay, um, we had another one that finished the, the, the Timothy Award. He actually completed three books while he was in TNT, the third through sixth grade, and then he got another book done this year in the junior high group, which is called Trek, and that is Evan Nichols. Is Evan here? And I'm really excited about this because... I want all you third through sixth graders to know you don't have to stop at sixth grade. You can keep right on moving up. And so Evan got his Timothy Award. And then this next one I am really excited about. I, as far as I know, it's probably the first time we've given one of these in the church. This is called the Meritorious Award. Hold it up where everybody can see it. This goes to Karina Kitt. And this is for completing two more books after the TNT, after the Timothy Award. And she has done this uh, in junior high during the trek um, time. And so that is a really nice award. Um, 
There is one more level that they can work for. It's called the Citation Award, and that requires completing four more books after the level of the Meritorious Award. And just to give you an idea of the, um, the value of the Iwana program, there's a number of Bible colleges that will give Bible course credits for kids who have finished up through the Citation Award. That's the level of, of material that we're covering in Iwana. So. We had the opportunity to go to Mexico the end of May, and uh, we just want to thank all of you for your prayers and uh, giving to make that possible. Uh, we had a great trip down there. Uh, we uh, went across the border without any problem, and there's a new highway down in, so we don't have to go through Juarez, which was a concern. So. Uh, that was uh, very easy to get across the border there. And so uh, while we were down there, we were, got down there uh, Saturday just afternoon and were able to uh, build the stairs and then uh, uh, went to church service and, and learned a lot as far as what their church is actually doing. Uh, Virgil Holt is and, and the New Tribes Mission is really responsible uh, for the solid church that we went to because he uh, trained Pastor Ulysses uh, in the New Tribes schooling there. And then this church also has a, a missionary that went out from their church that went through the New Tribes Mission and... Uh, is uh, working because of this Baptist church and their extension out, why they've uh, built a church uh, in the, for this missionary and in the aspect of uh, uh, letting some of their own stuff at their own church uh, be sacrificed a little because uh, the stairs that we built, why a lady in the church had been praying for a year for them stairs to be built. And so she was very appreciative. And, and this here little basket, uh, all four of us got this with some uh, popcorn and uh, lots of little goodies inside of it to eat on the way home. And, and the ladies of the church uh, helped make this basket. So uh, that's what you have to look forward to is their a deep appreciation. We're hoping that Pastor Ulysses and some of his church members can come up here in the fall for our missions conference and uh, in order to help us uh, plant our uh, Hispanic church and as well uh, to uh, the Bluegrass Gospel Festival, which we're having in August. We're hoping to use them funds as well that we get from that to help start our Hispanic church as well. And uh, our, our team was great. We, we had uh, uh, Mike Flint and uh, there's uh, uh, Pastor Tim and uh, Russ Simmons and myself and uh, it, it worked out really good as far as that amount going down there in the future. We recommend we stayed at the New Tribe School, and we're going to recommend that we stay there in the future, and also uh, that probably there's kind of a cap there of 10 to 12 people that can probably go there, so it will be limited on the amount of people. And so the next time we're planning on going would be the third week of July in the following year. It'd be in 2018. So thank you very much for your prayers. The Holy Spirit indeed is busy as we uh, as we become servants in his hand. 
He loves to work among people. And that is so, so good. I th just like to thank everybody. I think of the Iwana ministry and the effect that it, um, it has had on these little ones, even, even my own kids looking back and um, the spiritual life that it starts them on. And that opportunity to serve in different ways. Uh, serve maybe in changing light bulbs or serve as going down into Mexico or wherever. And Kelsey now in Vietnam uh, serving there and people serving all over the world, all directed by the Holy Spirit. I'd like to ask you to stand again. You know, the Spirit, Tim's going to bring this out. And the Spirit, uh, the word for Spirit is pneuma. That is the breath, the very breath of God. And that's this, uh, the inspiration is uh, of this song. Breathe on me, breath of God. So sing with us, if you will. May that be really at the center of our hearts that we would be filled by your spirit, controlled by you, that, Lord, our lives that we live out would be honorable and glorifying and worshiping and praising to you and you alone. God, that the things that you direct us to do would be at the center of our hearts the center of our lives, our focus to live out 
the life that the Lord Jesus leads us to. God, that you would use us to build your kingdom here on this earth while we have time as we are called to do. And Lord, a, a great part of that is not only a surrender of our lives, but a giving back to you of the resources that you have so generously given us. Whether it be serving in a church cleaning, whether it be going around the world speaking the gospel of Jesus Christ, whether it be offerings back to you that you might use others, that the resources would be there to build up the church of Chihuahua or to businessmen in Vietnam or whatever you call God, that we could be a part of that even in our giving. So Lord, we present our offering now to you and we pray God that you would be honored in the giving of it and that you would um, expand it and help us to be very diligent and careful in its use. For we pray for your glory and in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Please be seated. Good morning. I ran into my sword. It's a joy to be with you this morning. Uh, we get the uh, opportunity to celebrate in dedication of twins this morning. And before I have the family come up, I just want to share a little bit about dedication and uh, the picture of it and what it's really, the, the heart of it. I, I love just getting to visit with uh, Blaine and Jessica about their kids and their heart for the Lord. Uh, probably many of you know what this might, might is, so if I can open it up. You ever seen one of these? 
Yeah, I, I see some people nodding their heads. Yeah, it's, it's uh, actually this, my mother gave this to me. And it used to set at the, the well uh, at their home at Eddyville. It's a well cup. And it's just one of those that pops open like this. And so it would always be there so you could have that great water. I remember drinking some water over there in Eddyville and loved that picture of it. And the reason I bring this and, and want to share this because about the picture of dedication. It, we see the, the picture of Hannah bringing Samuel and dedicating this, this little one to the Lord. This picture of it. We see it with Jesus, uh, with Joseph and Mary, eight days bringing the Lord Jesus, the baby Jesus, to the temple. But I, but I want to expand on that just a bit. In 2 Samuel 23, 16 through 17, David is speaking here, or is, is talking in this issue. He, he was in Bethlehem, and he longed for a drink of this water from that well. He longed for that. And, and three of the mighty men that were with him, because the Philistines had surrounded this area, and, and three of these mighty men broke through the camp to go and get their commander a drink of this water. And he brings back this water from this well that David longed to drink from. He brings it to them. And we see here in Scripture, as David says this, he says, O Lord, that I should do this, shall I drink the blood of the men who went at the risk of their lives. Therefore, he would not drink it. He poured it out. The reason that David poured this water out was because he wouldn't drink for himself. And, and, and Oswald Chambers writes about this, and he says, whatever blessing we have from the Lord, it is to be poured back to the Lord. Otherwise, it will make us bitter and sour. And you know, how many people have children and think they're theirs? And, and they, they become consumed with that perception. And it, and it gets in the way of raising these kids for the glory of God and who they really belong to. And, and visiting with Jessica and Blaine, hearing their, their, their hearts about they know these beautiful children belong to belong the Lord Jesus Christ. And so with that, would you guys come on up? We want to dedicate these beautiful twins. And Adrian's coming with them, and I understand Adrian's going to even share some scripture, and so having them come on up. What a joy it is we get a share in this and how, how fitting it is, the picture, having Awanas Awards, because uh, they did talk to me about how important Awanas has been to their family and uh, how they have come to, uh, to see Christ through that, that ministry and how powerful that is. Here comes Miles and Charlie and Adrian smiling big. You've gotten taller. You've you got to stop growing, you know that? Your dad's taller than me. It won't be long. You'll be taller than me too, right? Yeah. Well... What a beautiful family, and uh, what a great opportunity that we get to celebrate with them. Dedication is, is for the family. It's really, as we talked about, is for parents, that they are committing their lives to following Christ all the days they have and leading their children and pointing them to Christ all the days they have with them. And we get to be a part of this. And, and how important it is that we come alongside them and, and that we, we help them. We uh, jump in and help out with vacation Bible school, all those kinds of things. Would you please stand? Because I have a question for all of us as a body of Christ. Will you commit as a body of Christ to come alongside this family and help them to, to raise them, to help them, pointing them to Christ, to come alongside when the trials of life hit? Will you do that? If so, answer, we will. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And Lane and, and Jessica, I want to ask you, as we've talked about it, but will you commit to raising uh, these two beautiful kids and this young man right here, uh, all the days that you have, pointing them to Christ, all that you have? If so, answer, we will. We will. And you have some scripture that you'd like to read. Let me just pull this up. Get that really high. There we go. Yeah, yeah you do. The verse we found is Proverbs 22, verse 6. Start children off the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Yeah. Adrian's going to share. My height. <laughs> Thessalonians 3, verse 3. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from evil. Oh, cool. Nice job. Good job. 
well, let's dedicate them. How are we going to do this? I hadn't even thought of this. I, you know, it's been a long time since I, I'll just come behind you. How about this? Let's just join in prayer now. You want to come on right up here, buddy? Yeah, let's, let's just dedicate these kids to the Lord. Father, we just thank you for, for Miles and for Charlie, these beautiful, precious little ones. We ask, Lord, that you will just give this family strength to, to point them to you all the days they have. Lord, I pray for the body that they will just be faithful in coming around this family, loving them. Lord, I, I ask, Lord, that you will just now uh, bless these two little ones. We dedicate them now to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. Amen. And we, we give you this box just to kind of keep the treasures of their, their spiritual walk. These are letters from me to be opened to nineteen twenty nine. I think that's the correct date. That's 12, when they're 12 years old and you can't peek. <laughs> and then these are just certificates of the dedication. And then we like sharing this book with uh, young families, The Legacy Path. It kind of outlines this, the milestones as you lead your children and your family. Also, the deaconess didn't, were unable to get the Bibles to me today, but you'll be getting Bibles from them. So we thank you so much, and God bless. Let's give it all a hand. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Thanks for coming out. I love dedications, and uh, what a beautiful picture, a beautiful picture of, uh, of the Lord. Uh, before I, I, we dive into the message, um, and I, I must say it's also it's time for Children's Church too, so uh, there we go. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the cue. Um, this morning I was on the phone with uh, Mike and Karina Flint and Bob Carson uh, in his, is in his last hours. This is Karina's dad. Uh, he is, uh, I was, had the opportunity to pray with the family this morning, uh, in the waiting, or in the, the actual Bob's, Bob's room, he had a stroke. I'm not sure if it was on Friday, or yet, I think it was probably Friday when he had a, a massive stroke. And uh, the, the medical staff told the family that, that he does not have long. The joy that we know is that Bob knows the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Praise God. And... <clears throat> can imagine what that hospital room must be like. Uh, from what I understand that uh, Mike and Karina and uh, other siblings are there, or other, the other kids are there as well. And uh, we all probably know how difficult those moments are, how fitting it is that we were praying that the Holy Spirit, and uh, the Word tells us that, to pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit with them. And before I begin in the message, I just want to just take this time and just pray for them. Father, we uh, thank you for Bob. Lord, I thank you hearing the testimony of his life, that he loves you, and that he follows you, and soon, very soon, from the words from Mike and Karina, that he is going to be with you. And Lord, we, we trust the promises of your word, the absolute promises of your word that promises that believers will be with you, that Bob will be with you. Lord, I, I pray this morning that uh, you just fill that room with your presence, Lord. Will you just fill that place with your Holy Spirit? And I, I pray for your peace, that you can go into your arms peacefully. And as the family grieves, it will not be as unbelievers, but as believers knowing that they will see their, their father again. Lord, we, uh, we, we celebrate that truth, but we, uh, we grieve with our brother and sisters in this, in this time. We ask this now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Continue to lift them up. And I, I did have my phone with me just because Mike was going to contact me when, as soon as we knew anything was happening, what had happened. So, um, again, just keep, keep them in your prayers. We're, we're continuing down this path with the book of Acts, and uh, we're in Acts chapter 2, and if you would please stand as the reading of God's holy word, and grab your Bibles, we're in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, I apologize, I do not have the pew Bibles number on this, 
But as, as Doug has said, this was an event. In fact, I entitled this message, The Event. It profoundly impacted the church. It profoundly impacts us today. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, where they were seating, sitting. And divided tongues as, as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and other parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said they are filled with new wine. Father, we just pray that your spirit will speak to us today. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. As we've talked about, as we've got, gotten to chapter 2 now in Acts over a few weeks, that this is really a picture of the Acts of the Holy Spirit. I know that in your, if you have an ESV Bible, and it says the Acts of the Apostles in the subtitle, but it actually is, if you really study this particular letter or book, it is actually the Acts of the Holy Spirit. It's the Acts of God moving in people's lives and moving amongst the disciples and those believers that were with them, the apostles. And so before I, I dive into the pieces of this, I, I want you to understand some more about the letters of Luke. Luke is writing the most excellent Theophilus, the Gospel Luke and also in Acts. You'll see that in Acts 1.1. And Luke is very concise in how he is writing. And you know, I shared this earlier in, in the, the Sunday school class. I'm amazed as a studying Luke again in Acts and in the Gospel Luke, how concise his writing is and how single-minded it is. A, a couple of weeks ago, or three weeks ago, I shared that uh, Luke's ten, Luke 10, 20. When, when Luke reminds us through the writing of the Holy Spirit, or the leading of the Holy Spirit, he wrote down this. He says we are to celebrate one thing. One thing that our names are in the book. And, and la last week I shared that, you know, we are not to be distracted like in Luke 10, we see that Martha was distracted with her service. And, and, and Jesus reminds her, he says that Mary will not have this taken away from her because her focus is right, her relationship with Christ. And today I just want to share with you about the focus of forgiveness of sins. One of the pictures in the Gospel of Luke as well as in Acts, you will see noted that Luke is very concise about writing the receiving of the forgiveness of sins. In, in, in Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. What a picture. You know, I, I pray you don't miss that when it comes to understanding the gospel and the, the picture of Acts, the single-mindedness of this focus. It is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. The forgiveness of sins, not being distracted from that relationship and understanding that we celebrate one thing, that our names are in the book. And as we divide this passage today, these passages, these 13 passages, what a huge event what an, a remarkable change to the Christian life. You know, as you study this particular passage, you, you know, nothing compares to the, the coming of Christ, his birth, 
to the, his life on this earth, the crucifixion and then the resurrection, and then you come to this, after his ascension, this incredible event that we are the benefactors of today, that we understand that through the scriptures, the truth of who the Holy Spirit is and how he works in our lives and to seek this. And I know that over the years it may have not been a a particular focus uh, in the church to speak boldly and upfront about the Holy Spirit for fear of different reasons. But I pray that we do that as we go through this particular study of Acts. If you look at Acts 2.1, beginning there, it talks about Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost arrived, Luke has given us a very concise moment in time when this event took place. Pentecost, the word it means 50th. That's what it means. The 50th day. This is a day of an annual feast in the Jewish calendar. One of the things as you study the Jewish calendar, you'll find very quickly that it's very common sense kinds of things. And this was the Feast of Harvest, or sometimes it's called the Feast of Weeks. A week was seven days, right? A week of weeks is seven weeks times seven or 49 days. Consequently, the 50th day is Pentecost. It is also called the, the Festival of First Fu- F- Fruits. Let me slow down here. I need to take my Ritalin. Um, but it, it's, it's the first, it, it is a festival of one day. The Jews would interrupt this time of harvest to celebrate what God has done in their lives. And it was very, very pointed that this day, Pentecost, was a day of celebrating God the harvest. How fitting that the Holy Spirit was poured out upon all those who are believers. And then you go to Acts 2.1 again, and you'll see at the latter part of that verse, it says, and they were all together in one place. This is huge. They were all together. They were all together, 120 plus believers in the upper room, not far from, from the Temple Mount, not far from uh, uh, the, in, on your bulletin. You will see on the front of your bulletin that those steps on the south side. They were not far from this particular place. And this will become significant actually when we come to the part when Peter starts giving his speech later on in chapter 2. But they were all together. You know, last couple weeks we've gone through the list of who that was in there. And what they, and this is significant when you start understanding who was in this room. We have Peter. Probably every one of us, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to know how Peter failed. When we were down in Mexico, I was reminded every morning because a rooster started crowing about 4.30 in the morning. Reminded, oh yeah, Peter, <laughs> I remember the story. He crowed three times. Well, that rooster's crowing a thousand times, man, and it's not even five o'clock. Then I found out they had a whole bunch of roosters over there. That's Mexico, though. <laughs> but we all know the failings of Peter. He was there. And we know that, that he understood the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and the love of Christ. We have Simeon the Zealot, or Simon the Zealot, however you want to pronounce that. You know, here's this guy who, who basically, for a cause, would kill you. He'd pull the sword out and he would, he would kill you if you were not on his side. Because he was a man that was, was determined for the glory of Israel. And here he is in the room. He knew the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Matthew, a tax collector, hated. He knew the forgiveness of Christ. Philip. Philip, when he, he heard about Christ, he, it's recorded in, in uh, Luke. It's also recorded in John. That actually, in John, he said this. He said, well, nothing good comes from Nazareth. Jesus' hometown. He knew the forgiveness of sin. Thomas, he, he abandoned the group for eight days. Comes into the upper room later on and, and he, he says, I will not believe until I see. And he heard the Lord's voice and he, accept, he, he believed immediately. He knew the forgiveness of Christ. Then we have the women that were there. Salome. Salome is the mother of John and James. Sons of, sons of thunder. 
And in Matthew chapter 20, we see Salome say this to Jesus, and he said to her, what do you want? Jesus was asking her, because she came to him and says, I'd like this, would you do something for me? And Jesus says, what is it to you that you want? And she said to Jesus this, she said, say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at the right, the other hand at the left in your kingdom. Now, any of you guys have ever had your mother go fight for you to play on the football team or on the baseball team? Did you enjoy that? You know, you, you probably took the ridicule of everybody else on the team. Well, that's exactly what happened to them because the rest of the apostles were indignant with them. Salome knew the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and the love of him. And then we have Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was a, uh, in verse, uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 2, we see this, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. See, they all knew something. First, they all knew the forgiveness and the love of Jesus Christ. They all knew this very intimately. See, it's like us. What draws us together but understanding the love and the forgiveness of our Lord Jesus Christ? What pulls us together, and they were all together. This is what church is about. That we understand this truth and that we are bonded together knowing the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and the love of Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.14, it says, the love of Christ compels controls me. This is what was happening in this upper room. They knew this intimately. You know, I, I fondly look back to a February, the first February I was here, and setting down for a couple of, of evenings, basically, or an evening and, an, and a morning, and hearing the testimonies of every leader in this church. And I, I, I often go back to that because Every person spoke of the forgiveness of Christ in their life. Praise God, this is what pulls us together. Just as this baby church here, 120 in this upper room pulled together. And it comes alive when you see Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and the power of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sin and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me, they were standing in it. Second thing that I'd ask you to understand about this, they were all together. They had all seen firsthand witnesses of the effects of evil. They all understood it in a powerful way. They had witnessed Judas Iscariot and the consequences of evil. And, and how it, and they would have a clear understanding of seeing the field where Judas' body was, had fallen apart. They watched the, the consequences of that evil. This group of people understood this in this early church. Last week I shared with you, I don't know if you can do this at church, but I'm going to do it. Oh, there we go. This is my, my sword that was given to me by my father-in-law. It's an old sword. But last week I talked about evil. And what is evil? You know, evil is not a thing. And, and I gave the example of rust. In fact, if you look at this, Ed, you can take a look at this. I haven't taken care of this. There's rust on it. Quite a bit of rust. You know, and I, I, I pulled this out the other day and I'm like, well, this, we got a problem here. There's all kinds of rust on this. See, evil is like that rust. If I don't take care of it, eventually that, e that rust is going to eat away at the metal until there's nothing left. Is that not what happened to Judas? You know, evil doesn't exist. It's not a thing unless there's good. And it absolutely destroys. And the early church understood this. And it's vitally important we understand this. I don't know about you, but I'm really getting sick of the news to hear how many more have been killed. And finally to hear some, uh, the, one of the leaders from, from London or from England stood up and finally said the evil. Finally said the word. 
even in secularism, they're starting to understand that this evil exists. The early church understood this. They understood it very well. Members of the early church understood the intentions of Satan. They warned one another to resist evil. In James 4, 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. They understood what they would face in the tribulations and the evil that they were going to come up against was mighty. But they understood that they were following the one who had victory over that evil. The devil, God's enemy, constantly tries to hinder God's work. But he is limited by God's power and can only do what he is permitted to do. We see that in Job chapter 1 through uh, uh, first part of chapter 2. And the word Satan actually means accuser. See, Satan actively looks for people to accuse and attack. And I'd like you to note something with this. Satan likes to attack believers and his demons. And they're real. Who are vulnerable in their faith. Who are spiritually weak. And don't miss this last part. Who are isolated from other believers who are isolated. You know, when I heard about Karina's father, I, I, I immediately had to call. And I had a chance and I texted and then I was so thankful that Mike called. See, because the body of Christ, we need to be there with each other. And I love seeing what's happening in this church that more and more seeing the understanding that we can't go through this isolated. We need each other. I love what's happening in Celebrate Recovery that people are coming in who have been isolated with addictions, with habits and hurts that have kept them isolated. Our understanding the significance of coming together, this early church, we're all together, they understood it. And they understood what they were facing. The question is, do we? Do we understand it? I pray that those six seniors that are, were sending off to college, wherever they're being sent off to, understand the importance to not be isolated where they go. That they need a body of Christ to connect to, to be with. In this picture, we see three signs, and I've got to speed up. And suddenly there came from heaven, verse chapter two, Acts 2, verse 2. And there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. See, there's probably way too much emphasis, and this is probably purely my opinion, but way too much emphasis on the tongues. Don't miss the sound and the sight of Pentecost. What they saw was wind. They saw fire. And they saw languages. The wind is, uh, as Doug spoke of, is the, the pneuma. P-N-E-U-M-A. It's actually where we get the word pneumatic. Many construction folks know that. The pneumatic gun. Right? Pneuma. It's the wind. In the Greek, it can mean breath, wind, or spirit. And it's this, 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 is, this was no ordinary wind. They had waited for this. Jesus told them before he ascended into heaven, he says, wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon you. You'll know it. <laughs> Boy, did they know it. This wind came up. It's the visible manifestation of the invisible God. I want you to see something, and if you, you've got your Bibles, join me in John chapter 3. Because Nicodemus didn't understand this wind. He didn't understand this wind. Nicodemus comes to Jesus. He's a Pharisee. He's a well-known Pharisee. He was on the Sanhedrin. And he comes to Jesus and he says, uh, um, I know you are a rabbi, you're a teacher and from God, but tell me about this. And Jesus begins to tell him about you must be born again. And you must be born of spirits and water. And then he says this word, the wind blows, it's verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, 
but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You know, it's one of those things that one of the reasons why sometimes it becomes a little difficult to talk about the Holy Spirit because sometimes we you know, can't even find words. This last week I've had long conversations with Jessica's mom, Shelly, and Jessica's daddy, Rod. Jessica went home to the Lord. She was 15. She died of bone cancer just about 10 days ago. And, and, and I, I, Shelly asked me, she says, so what are you, what are you studying, Tim? Because we talked over the years, and she was asking me, and I said, we've been studying the Holy Spirit. And she says, oh, I've got to tell you a story. On that Tuesday that she died, it was early in the morning, and they knew that it was close. And Jessica was having a lot of breathing problems and difficulties, and, and of course, Shelley and Rod were right there, and other family members, Brother Alec and Elizabeth. And <clears throat> Jessica kind of said, can I just, I need a little bit of a break. Can I just have a moment? And, and they respected that, and they left the room, and Shelley said she was outside of the room, and she was waiting, and she said she had this overwhelming nudge, get in there. Get in in there. She immediately got up, grabbed Rod, tanned, and we went in. And moments, moments later, they were holding Jessica as she took her last breath and went home. And I was blown away to hear a mother say, you know how much God loves me? That she gave me that moment with my daughter. The pneuma. The wind. It moved in her heart. We all know it when it happens. It's a beautiful picture. I was so thankful that Shelly shared that story with me, and she says, please share that with your body so people come to understand the beautiful picture of the wind, the pneuma. They were filled with the Spirit. They were moved with it. You know, Nicodemus, he didn't understand it. He did not understand it at this point. And we don't know from Scripture, did he understand it? Second, we see the sign of fire. The fire was symbolic of two things. Fire was the source of light. You realize when we step outside, you're getting light from a big ball of fire. The sun. Uh, The the light in in previous history, we know that the light came as a candle. It was light. So we know that it's coming. It illuminates. The Holy Spirit illuminates. Secondly, fire is a source of warmth. Jesus tells us in Revelation chapter 3, 15 and 16. He says, I don't don't care for this lukewarm. I pray that you're hot on fire for the Lord. And you know, this is the picture that we are called to be in. And see, this is what happened afterwards that we see a group of people that were on fire for the glory of God. And we see that it moved amongst these 120 and it spread in a powerful way in which we will see. And then it was inspired speech. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want to note that word filled. The word calls us for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, Do not get drunk with wine as it leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Spirit controls us as we surrender to Him. He is the one leading us. And we're told that to be asked for the filling. Every time I step up, the first thing that I start my morning with on Sundays, and I start it actually every day, Lord Jesus, will you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Will you guide me? Give me the strength to surrender, not my will, but your will be done. And I pray that you're the filling of the Holy Spirit. And you'll notice something. There was no Rosetta Stone in this at all. It was inspired speech from the Holy Spirit that gave him utterance to speak all these different languages. It was all about God moving in them. It wasn't anything that they did. It was nothing that they accomplished or they did, or prayed a certain way, or did a certain thing. It was all the Holy Spirit, God himself, moving amongst them. 
You know, I, I want to draw a correlation to something that a lot of times is missed, is the Tower of Babel, described in, in, in Genesis chapter 11, 1 through 9. See, after the flood, God commanded humanity to increase in number and fill the earth, 11, or excuse me, Genesis 9, 1. Humanity decided to do the exact opposite, though. They come and let us build ourselves a city, they said, in a tower that reaches the heavens, and that they would build a name for themselves. It was all about their own doing. Humanity decided to build this great city and congregate there and go against what God had called them to. And this tower remembered as the Tower of Babel. In response, God confused the languages of humanity so that they could no longer communicate with each other. Genesis 11:7. The result was that people congregated with other people who spoke the same language. And they went together and settled in other parts of the world. Genesis 11, 8 through 9. My point? When man was doing it, it caused the scattering. What do we see here at Pentecost? God was doing it. And it was uniting. Because it was about the truth of who his son is. It was about the truth of if you believe in him, if you have faith in him, you will have life eternal. Isn't that a powerful paradigm shift that this is a beautiful picture of uniting the spirit gave them the ability to speak they were filled with the Holy Spirit it was all about the Holy Spirit moving in them who gave them the utterance to speak in the different languages so that the gospel would go out that all would come to know the truth that's why it is so important that that we be a church body that goes out Mexico, Vietnam, wherever it is that we are called, that we will not hold back, that we will go forth in that. The last point, in Christ, every tribe and tongue are reunited as one people. One people. If you look at this, if you look at the front of your bulletin, I took that picture standing on the south steps. I took this picture. That's a woman that I heard her speak. She spoke Mandarin. She was, I believe, from China. You know, what blew me away was, was wherever we went in the Holy Land, we heard every language. I remember sitting in Jerusalem on, a, on top of this little restaurant, was on top of this, this building. It was an outside restaurant. And, and uh, we were sitting there and we were kind of in the middle of about five or six different tables on each side. And we were trying to decide all the languages that we heard. And, and, and in fact, uh, I finally just had to finally ask the group behind us because I couldn't tell, is it French? Uh, is it Dutch? Is it Swedish? You know, and I, I fi finally I said, so are you, are you Dutch? And he goes, no, we're Swedes. I said, well, duh, I wouldn't know that. Um, <laughs> But my point is this, to hear all these languages made me think about this moment that we just read in Acts. All these languages. Luke lists them very carefully. Parinthians, they spoke Persian. Medes, Kurdish. Elamites. Elamites, that language is extinct. It has not been discovered uh, since Alexander the Great and the, the theory is that, that he wiped them out. And this language is ex extinct. Mesopotamia was Sumerian. Judea, Aramaic. Aramaic and Hebrew. Cappadocia, Greek and Tur Turkish. Pontus, Greek, Asia, possibly Mandarin or Arabic. Phrygia was a Greco-Phrygian language. Pamphylia was Greek. Egypt, most likely Arabic. Libya of Cyrene, Greek. Rome, Greek. Get the point. The powerful work of the Holy Spirit that all would be united in knowing the truth and coming to saving grace and salvation, receiving the forgiveness of sins, that they would know Jesus Christ. What a powerful picture. 
And you know what the picture is? It's for us today. I pray no one walks out of here thinking that this incredible event was then and only then. It's for us today. And I want to share a story. I called him this morning, my buddy Raphael. And I, I told him, I said, I want him to come up and tell the rest of his story. And he gave me permission to share his story. It's a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit moving. When we started, launched into the Hispanic church, we had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> Absolutely no clue. Just like here, have no clue what God has planned. No idea. And we launched into this thing, and, and I remember Belle was the first, one of the first gals that stepped forward, and she started helping us with the ESLs, English as a Second Language. And Belle was from, from Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. And she had a passion that, that she could help other women to speak English who were Hispanic and also share the gospel. And she used strictly the Bible to teach ESL. I loved it. And, and Belle started praying for her brother when we started and launched into this church. I had no clue who her brother was. And then I got to know Belle, and she was the first bapt one to be baptized in the, um, <clears throat> in the church, in the Hispanic church. And, and Belle started, we started praying together for her brother, Raphael. Raphael was in the federal prison in Colorado, a maximum secure prison in Colorado. He was <clears throat> convicted in Nebraska, I think, western part of the, of the state, he was convicted moving several pounds of methamphetamine. He was a member of a, a Mexican cartel. And he was a part of this, this group. And he was sentenced to around, I think it was around 15 years in the maximum secure prison. And, he tell, and then I got to know Raph a little bit through Bell. And Belle told me that we'd been praying, and she told me that, that Raph had come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as, her Lord and, as his Lord and Savior. In the federal prisons, I think probably if you've been around any kind of prison ministry or anything, you know that the, in, the inmates run the prison. It's no different in a federal prison. And <clears throat> that particular morning, he was supposed to, to conduct a mark. In other words, he was supposed to take a guy out for the cartel or the group he was associated with. And Raph tells a story that he was walking across the, the courtyard and the head guy of that group that he was associated with was he thought was in solitary confinement. When he was walking across that room, that, that courtyard, he heard, <clears throat> Raph, don't do it. I've got to talk to you. And, and Raph says, I don't know. He said, this is the first time that he recalled that he ever fell to his knees in his prison cell before he went out and go, go across the courtyard that he fell to his knees and he prayed. And he listened to his leader. And then he ended up meeting up with his leader a few days later and his leader told him, he says, I fell to my knees and I says, I can't do this anymore and I ask Christ to be my savior. And I'm challenging you, Raphael, to do the same. Raphael fell to his knees and he accepted Christ at that moment. He said the radical changes that changed everything. How the Spirit moved in his life. It gave him friends to connect with other believers so he wasn't isolated in that prison. He had men that helped him to grow in the truth of God's word. He was growing. And he said it blew him away when he was given enough points and it was completely out of the blue that he was sent to a more minimum secure kind of facility up in Minnesota. And his actual guard that he was assigned to actually was a Christian and was leading him deeper into the word. And Bell was telling him about all the things happening in the Hispanic church in Kearney, Nebraska. And, and Bell showed him a picture of Cosby Cosby's visited us a few times. And Cosby, he, 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 he says, I'm going to marry that girl. And he began to pray. And Raph asked to be assigned to Kearney, Nebraska for his last parole run. And he was assigned to live in Kearney, Nebraska, and he began to attend. 
the Hispanic church in Kearney. And it wasn't long that he was dating Belle last December or two Decembers ago, back in 16. I officiated their wedding. He married Cosby. Just a few weeks ago, they dedicated their first child. And my conversation with Raphael today was about, Tim, God has called me to be a pastor. He's studying to be a pastor. When I look at that picture, I see the wind, the pneuma, moving all the way through this man's life. Just as it is in the picture that we see from the scriptures, it's for now. And I pray the pneuma moves in you, that you surrender whatever it is that's in the way, that you will not hang on to anything but just him. I pray you walk out of this today and you will think and you have to come back and you have to look and see how the pneuma has moved in your life and is moving in your life. Surrender to him. And I pray you understand the importance that we don't get isolated, that we come together and that we allow the Holy Spirit to move among us. And wherever it may be, how do we reach those that do not know him? Father, I just thank you for the beautiful picture of your word. The incredible examples over and over and over that we see your spirit moving among us and in us and through us. When I look out at the faces here, I see so many how the Holy Spirit has moved and is moving in their lives, and I thank you for that. And Lord, I pray that the number of those that you're moving in will just continue to increase. Lord, help us to be a body that stays all together, supporting each other. Hearing today that women have come together and are providing meals for Aaron and Larissa. Lord, I know that we can't be in Omaha. We long to be. Lord, we pray for your spirit to move in that room, guarding and protecting. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the gift that you've sent us in the spirit. We thank you, spirit. We love you. We ask all these things now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We pray that you enjoy God's grace today. Make sure you greet our family that dedicated their children today. Go in his grace, enjoy his grace. You're dismissed.